Welcome. Thank you for joining us. This is Bruce Booth, one of the partners at Atlas Venture, and I'm privileged to present to you the Atlas 2018 Year in Review. Over the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to cover three things. One, a macro deep dive around some of the issues facing the pharmaceutical industry, then explore the venture and biotech ecosystem, and lastly, close with an update on Atlas Venture. Drilling in on the macro side, really want to kick off with the global growth challenge. Today, $800 billion of sales, branded pharmaceuticals around the world. Growth has been slowing, as you can see on the right, a negative trend line on growth. Revenue growth, and in particular revenue quality, is a critical concern to the industry, in part because it integrates lots of underlying issues facing the industry. If you break down the component parts, looking at volume and price, becomes a great framework to explore a number of those issues. But it's not so much absolute revenue that we're interested in, but instead the changes in revenue. What are the forces likely to drive significant changes over the next few years? So let's explore the components of volume. On the volume side, there are at least three positive drivers. Demographics and geography, two extrinsic factors, and then new products, that intrinsic output of our innovation engines. On the demographic side, all of you are familiar with the population pyramid. In fact, in the US, EU, and Japan, this is more of a population pillar with a giant graying wave getting older, confronting the diseases of aging, Alzheimer's, heart disease, cancer, blindness, and hearing. 200 million people today in these regions are older than 65. Over the next five to 10 years, another 200 million people will be older than 65. To put that in context around pharmaceutical demand, the average person older than 65 in the U.S. fills over 30 prescriptions a year. This is an enormous future driver of prescription volume. On the geographic side, in addition to graying, the countries of the pharma emerging markets like China, Brazil, Russia, and India have also seen increased access to health care and rising global incomes. They've gone from a billion prescriptions 10 years ago to two billion today and likely two and a half in just a few years. As you can see on the right, growth rates have slowed largely because the denominator has gotten larger. But these are still four and five percent growth rates. To put that in context, the U.S. is about a six billion prescriptions growing at around one percent. So again, geography, a significant contributor to overall volumes. The third area is around new products. This year, the FDA is on track for 55 to 60 new therapeutic drug approvals. As you can see over the last four years, five years, four of those have been well above the 20-year industry average. All of these 200 or so products are in their early innings of launching and reaching new patient populations and driving the sorts of prescription demand um, that, that are likely um, to, be, to be achieved. On the right-hand side, a few of the um, logos of some of the great drugs that got approved this year. In a bit of self-promotion, Alnylam got Onpatra approved, a company that we helped um, start and fund back in 2002. And Mgality, a new migraine antibody approved by Lilly. In fact, Atlas helped develop that asset from its first in human study through human proof of concept in a company called Arteus that was later bought back by Eli Lilly. In fact, those types of external relationships and external R&D as a whole attribute two-thirds of these new approvals in the last few years. A different originator and a different marketer showing the integration of our overall biotech and pharma ecosystem. Behind these great approvals, there are a number of really exciting clinical programs in development. Polling the Atlas team, these were eight that we decided to highlight this year. SAGE with its two depression programs now in front of the FDA. Sarepta with its gene therapy for microdystrophin in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, followed quickly behind by Pfizer and Solid Biosciences, some really intriguing early data. Luce Patercept from Acceleron and Celgene showed very strong anemia data in MDS and thalassemia. Looks like it's going to be a significant product in those areas. And then in atopic dermatitis, an innate immune cytokine, IL-33, and an antibody that blocks it has shown lots of promise from Anaptis Bio. 
unlike past years. We've actually had three in cardiovascular and metabolic disease area that we'd like to highlight this year. Lily's data with their twin cretin, diabetes and obesity product just a few weeks ago showed very striking data around both glucose control, HbA1c, as well as weight loss. In the area of NASH and fatty liver, continued excitement in that field. I'll call out one of them, Madrigal, with its um, selective beta, um, beta thyroid receptor agonist, has shown very nice data, and in particular, helped correlate invasive biopsy data with non-invasive imaging data, something that I think will present a path for younger emerging biotech companies. Then lastly, Ameren published uh, recent data with Facepa at a uh, recent cardiology meeting showing a 25% reduction in mortality in folks with very high risk, high triglycerides. While some controversy about the data, a 25% mortality reduction is very significant. And then lastly, around childhood epilepsies, GW Pharmaceuticals' recent approval, they published several phase three studies earlier in the spring around these infantile epilepsies, an area of grievous unmet medical need. Really wonderful to see the progress in those areas. And so these eight, and lots of runners up behind them, are what inspire us about the pharmaceutical industry. Great drugs having impact on patients. But of course, not everything in our industry works. Yeah. Slide of industry schadenfreude, here are six small and mid-cap biotech failures for the year. I think the largest and uh, most significant of these failures was probably Insight's IDO failure back in April of the year, really failing to show the kind of synergistic benefit that we wanted to see in the immuno-oncology area. We've also had other failures from Merrimack in cancer, along with a host of others. CNS, especially with more general mechanisms, has been an area of continued disappointment. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. And then lastly, even something is um, supposedly simple as itch. The biology has um, managed to managed to confuse us, and uh, Menlo, Menlo Therapeutics certainly suffered the consequences earlier this year. But small companies aren't the only ones who've, uh, who've suffered some unexpected failures this year. Large Pharma has as well. Pfizer shut down its myostatin Duchenne's program. AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson failed to extend their inline products into COPD and DVT, respectively. And Rova T, the subject of the $8 billion stem centrics acquisition from AbbVie, does not seem to be holding promise. These types of failures obviously make sensational headlines in our industry, but the good news is there's fewer of them. This is work out of MIT earlier this year that showed that after a long period of declining probabilities of success from first in human studies to approval, we seem to be reversing that trend. Instead of one in 15 or one in 20, new, uh, new clinical starts making it to approval, that number is close to one out of six or one out of seven. Why is this? We think it's because of better prioritization, better improvements around technology and process, but in particular, the role of human genetics in helping not only to validate targets, but also in helping us pick the right patients for whom these drugs will respond. So those are three things that are all positive drivers for pharmaceutical volume um, over the coming years. But there are at least two breaks, orphanization and competition. On the orphan side, as many of you know, 40% of recent approvals target very small, rare, and orphan diseases. To put a fine point on the volume on the right-hand side, Three out of every 1,000 prescriptions are involved in rare and orphan diseases. This is an incredibly small source of volume and obviously puts a break on the overall volume growth in the industry. Shifting to competition, I'll start with branded competition, though I'll grant you this is more about company-level volume than overall aggregate volumes. But if you look at five of the biggest drug classes that launched in the 90s and 2000s, it took four or five years between the first entrant and the second entrant. Today, in most hot drug classes, there on the right-hand side, it's four or five months. Branded competition is now coming fast and furious. In addition, generic competition is coming sooner than it had in the past. Fifteen years ago, 
it would take 180 months or so before from launch to patent expiry. That has shortened by roughly 25%. Now, while many of us are big fans of generics and moving older drugs out to make way for new and more innovative medicines, it is important that we preserve the period of time that innovators can extract a reward for their risk taking. How is all this rolled together on volume? This is a striking chart on the left. U.S. branded volumes have actually shrunk by 40% over the last five or six years. We were 20% of a $5 billion, or $5 billion prescription market, and we are now 10% of a $6 billion prescription market. So a contraction in overall volumes by 40%. This is obviously a significant break on the overall volume equation in our industry. As we shift over to the price side of the equation, I'd like to walk through three things. One, global price pressure, then the U.S. complexity, and talk a little bit about value-based pricing. So starting our world tour, let's start in Japan. Japan is a single-payer system. Every two years, they extract double-digit biannual price declines across most major branded drugs. And on the right-hand side, Opdivo is a more egregious example. In fact, with some irony, it, it uh, obviously addresses the PD-1 receptor, where a Japanese professor just won the Nobel Prize for its discovery. But this product has seen a 75% reduction in price in its first four years on the market. So a very challenging pricing dynamic in Japan. As we shift across Asia to China, drug pricing and access is a central social issue in the country. Dying to Survive was a hit movie this summer, really putting it in the center of the societal dialogue. In order to get on to the national drug reimbursement list in China, you have to accept north of 50% price discounts relative to your tender or list price, and then subject yourself to annual price declines thereafter. The only silver lining in China is that volume may be able to compensate for price. Avastin is a good example. 2017, they had a 62% reduction in price but achieved a 50% increase in sales on four times the amount of volume. So that could be the silver lining here in China. Continuing around to Europe, five to 10% price declines over the last few years. Britain holding water, but largely a challenging price environment. It's for these reasons that the international reference pricing that was proposed by the Trump administration more recently is really a non-starter in terms of the pharmaceutical industry. As we shift over to the United States, the last bastion of quasi-free market pricing, we've seen list prices grow between 5 and 14% over the last few years. But of course, with rebating and discounting, the actual net price increases back to pharmaceutical companies are more like 2 or 3% these days, barely above the rate of inflation. But price is a huge driver of revenues in the United States. The top 45 products 60% of the growth in overall revenues from 2014 to 2017 was driven by price. And last year, those products grew 2%, all of which was due to price. So price is a critical issue, even in the U.S. market. Several years ago, the industry tried an act of self-regulation. Brent Saunders came out September 2016 with the social contract saying that Allergan wouldn't increase price by more than 10%. A number of other pharmaceutical companies followed suit and largely for two years um, helped control the issue and the, and the discussion. But in July, Ian Reid at Pfizer announced 40 products were going to move by 8 to 10% price increases. Received a call from the Trump administration. I'm not sure what was said on that call, but shortly thereafter, Ian Reid came out and said, they would rescind the price increases and hold price at 0% growth. In an act of industry solidarity, 10 other pharmaceutical companies um, similarly agreed to not raise prices for 2018, according to a recent report from Lyric. Given the role of price, it's highly likely that this is going to impact overall industry revenues. But beyond these acts of voluntary price restraint, it looks like middlemen are having an impact on overall pricing. Again, the 8 to 10% price increases here on the left side of this chart from CVS Health 
compared to what they're seeing in their own formulary. CVS helps manage these pharmacy formularies for large employers and insurers. And you can see that they've been able to constrain price growth to well less than 1%. Of course, this is part of the complexity of the U.S. system. If you look at a work from Peter Bach and others this summer, roughly $480 billion is spent in pharmaceuticals in the U.S. every year. But a full third of that goes to other players in the ecosystem, PBMs, pharmacies, providers, and insurers. There's no transparency on this. It's hard to understand where the discounts and rebates are going, high administrative costs, and most importantly, a big reputational issue for the industry. So moving beyond U.S. complexity, let's talk about value-based pricing. The first question is one of cost effectiveness. Is your drug worth it? This has been a question that in the U.S. we haven't been asking, but CVS Health recently suggested to their clients that they would not have to reimburse any drug that didn't have at least a $100,000 per year quality adjusted life year impact in the United States. That will eliminate a lot of cancer drugs that are well known and well prescribed today. Subject of some controversy, it hasn't been fully implemented, but it, this is a question that we are going to be asking increasingly in the U.S. system. The second question is, will you guarantee its effectiveness? Pay, pay for performance models in our system are going to happen. And if we in the industry have conviction that the drugs we are bringing to market are likely to deliver real value, we should be able to stand behind them. I think this is something that the industry as a whole needs to get behind. Harvard Pilgrim has been at the vanguard of this movement. This chart on the left highlights they have at least 10 contracts earlier this year. I think the number now is closer to 15. All of the drugs on the right have had or have these types of value-based contracts. Heart failure drugs being held to a rehospitalization rate. Diabetes drugs being held to HbA1c and glucose control targets. Real-world clinical data being linked back to the phase three trial data and a sliding scale of payments if you don't deliver what we promised. I think this is where the industry needs to continue to lead. These are very challenging contracts to put in place. There are regulatory issues. There are Medicaid, Medicare, best price issues, but this is something that we have to crack. And so rolling up then, you can see we do face challenges around the globe around pricing. Integrating that back into the volume equation helps to present where we are on overall revenues with puts and takes on both of these. But revenues are not everything. In fact, investors and um, stakeholders obviously are very interested in overall earnings. And so you have to consider the underlying cost structure. This is a generic cost structure in most pharmaceutical companies, 30% for SGNA, 30% for COGS, and roughly 20% in R&D. Most major pharma companies are actively trying to manage their cost structures, reducing R&D sites, headcounts, refocusing portfolios, altering the way that they are marketing products. No one has cracked the code on a truly efficient cost structure in our industry, but it is certainly the subject of much attention. As this gets rolled up into earnings, this is obviously a shining spot for our industry. It remains a profitable industry as a whole. The top 20, Top 20 pharmaceutical companies throw off $130 to $140 billion a year in aggregate operating income. Much of that is used in reinvestment, also for strengthening balance sheets. There are hundreds of billions of dollars on the balance sheets of these large companies for dividends and for share buybacks with some controversy. Lyric recently published a report that the top six biotech companies did $100 billion of share buybacks in the last few years with little or no overall impact. As you step up to the 60,000 foot level of our industry, what are the industry level pharmaceutical returns? This is a piece of work out of Wells Fargo, showed negative trend lines on both the return on assets and return on invested capital. Fortunately, if you look at 2017, 5% ROA and an 8% ROIC, are well above the cost, um, the cost of capital for our industry, continue to reinforce the message of it's an attractive place to invest, but these negative trend lines are a real concern. 
This obviously led um, David Maris to coin pharma entering a brave new world. We have this enormous global promise of new medicines, but faced with an increasingly hostile and challenging financial and payer dynamic. The only way through this is to have drugs whose value is self-evident, whose value is demonstrated by transforming the lives of patients. No pharmaceutical company has a monopoly on the discovery and development of these kinds of high-impact medicines, which emphasizes why pharmaceutical companies need to work with a plethora of biotech companies, all of whom are attempting to make these kinds of medicines. And so this is a great point then to transition from the macro into the venture and biotech ecosystem. I'd like to talk about two things in this section. One, the exciting equity capital markets that we've been in, and two, the changing M&A landscape. In the equity capital markets, if you read the title of news articles for the first nine months of the year, you'd see things about a bonanza of IPOs, huge amounts of funding, mega rounds, unicorns, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And you'd step away thinking, to quote my kid's favorite movie, that everything is awesome. And in fact, everything was awesome. We reached the XBI Biotech Index reached its all-time high in uh, the middle of the summer. But then, of course, October came. A massive equity sell-off, macro risks and volatility increased. It was the worst October in about 10 years. As of today, the biotech indices are off close to 20%. The S&P is off considerably and really a risk off overall sentiment. It's times like this that I think it's important to step back and look at the bigger picture. If you take a 10-year view of the biotech industry, you'll see that the two major indices are up over five-fold over that 10-year period and essentially two-fold over the last two and a half years. You'll also note several corrections along the way. In the spring of 2014, a correction of 20%. In late 2015, 30 or 40%, and now about 20%. But anytime you're reaching an all time high in your sector, I think it's worth stepping back and asking is that all time high being driven by froth, more of a bubble environment, or is it being driven as part of a long term rational cycle? And in full candor, there are data points on both sides of this equation. There are clearly some examples of froth while there are clearly examples of discipline. Let's walk through each of those. On the froth side, late stage in particular, but biotech venture funding flows, the types of investors involved, what that's done to valuations and preferred stock terms, clear evidence. On the venture funding side, this is a map or a chart of global biopharma venture funding of every quarter. And you'll see that the last four quarters are the four biggest quarters we've ever had in the history of the industry. Well over $20 billion has flowed in to private venture-backed biotech during the last year. This is up two to threefold over where we were just a few short years ago. Now, some of this is contributed by more traditional established venture firms, but a lot of it has come from both new entrants and atypical investors. In terms of new entrants, lots of new biotech specialist funds have been raised, whether from established firms like Bain or Deerfield or Andreessen Horowitz raising its bio fund, but also a lot of China and Asia-based LPs and commitments to new funds. In fact, 40% of all the Series Bs that have been raised by the industry or at Atlas Venture now contain participation by a China or Asia-based investor up from a very small number just a few years ago. Beyond these specialists, we've also seen the rise of more non-traditional investors actively engaging directly in biotech investing. Sovereign wealth funds, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority participated in the large financing of a West Coast biotech. Large asset management firms participating actively. Bailey Giffords invested in a number of funds or in a number of uh, biotech firms. Ping An, a large insurance company, has also invested directly in a Philadelphia-based Series A biotech company. Family offices have been investing heavily, some of whom are developing biotech specialist expertise and others more generally. And then even out of left field, IKEA's investment office 
invested in a half a billion dollar financing in a West Coast um, early stage biotech company. Now, some of these are likely to be committed investors who develop real conviction and expertise in biotech, but I think a number of others will be tourist investors. And whether, when the weather turns bad in the biotech equity markets, I think they will disappear. How has all this funding and activity changed the nature of uh, financing rounds? We've seen a huge rise in what I will call the $100 million mega round. Over 25 have been done in 2018. That's up five to tenfold over just a few years ago. On the right, global VC funding per startup is up to 25 or 30 million per round of financing. This again is up two to threefold over where we were earlier in the cycle. As capital has flown in, valuations have gone up. If we take a look at IPO valuations, median being the line in the middle bracketed by the top and bottom quartile, but the pre-money IPO valuations have gone from 150 million to roughly 350 million over the last five or six years. This is a significant uptick in overall valuations. The top end, the top quartile deal is now a half a billion dollar pre-money valuation. What's fascinating to me is that much of this represents earlier stage companies. In 2012, 75% of the IPOs were phase three or later. That number is close to 20% today. Nearly half of the IPOs this year and in 2016 were preclinical or phase one IPOs. Now, a number of those companies are the right kind of company to go public. They're big platforms and they need capital access to be able to grow, but a number of them should not. And this has caused pundits, in fact, at Stat News, they coined the phrase, are these pipelines or pipelines? And I think that's a very merited question. Shifting then to deal terms, this is a piece of work from Cooley's Venture Financing Report. You can see Series A's doubled in valuation. 85% of rounds are now up rounds. The vast majority of biotechs are delivering. Tranching has dropped from being in the majority of deals a few years ago to less than 20%. This important tool of investor discipline. I can tell you at Atlas, the vast majority of our deals are still tranched. And then lastly, participating preferred, that evil tool that greedy VCs use to protect themselves on the downside has gone from 60% or so of rounds down to less than a third. Now, while at Atlas, because we are founders of our companies and early stage investors, Many of these terms and changes are actually good for us. I think they do reflect an overall loosening of capital and less discipline in the investing marketplace. So those are six things that would indicate some areas of froth in the sector, but there are also an equal number of points around we are in a long-term rational cycle. First and foremost, we're making real medicines. Secondly, a view of the public equity market su suggests that there is discipline there is actually dispersion of performance. And then lastly, a view into the venture ecosystem itself, especially around early stage, is not suggestive of a broad bubble. On the medical breakthrough side, I think this is what inspires all of us in the sector. You take Emily in the top left, likely cured of leukemia through one of the early CAR-T therapies, or Creed in the bottom right, cured of congenital blindness, or Evelyn here in the middle, patient with SMA, you know, normally wouldn't even be able to sit up and feed herself, but here is doing push-ups in her doctor's office. Truly inspiring the kind of impact that the medicines we're developing as a sector can have on real patients. In light of this, you'd think there'd be enormous public equity fund flows into biotech, but in fact, looking at Lippers month by month, uh, fund flows in and out of the biotech equity sector would suggest that that is not the case. If this was a frothy bubble, you'd see that chart going up and to the right over this period of time. But in fact, that is not the case. We've seen puts and takes every month over the last few years. In fact, this rather muted level of fund flows into biotech is reflected in overall valuations. Public equity biotech multiples of the largest companies used to trade much higher than the S&P 500, but now trade at a discount to the rest of the S&P 500. Muted overall valuations certainly suggest we're not in some sort of runaway biotech bubble. 
The next three slides that I'm going to share get at the point that in a in a bubble, when you have a rising tide, it lifts all the boats, even those biotechs that are struggling. But that has not been the case in our sector. There has been significant dispersion in performance. If we take a look at eight biotech companies in that mid-cap, multi-billion dollar range, all of whom had late stage products or early launches that didn't go so well or hiccups in their R&D pipelines, they, are, they have traded significantly off of their all-time highs, which were reached over the last six years. They're now trading between 40 and 90% below those all-time highs, suggesting that investors are punishing disciplined around performance. Rolling this up into the overall um, sector, the XBI index has 120 companies in it. When it reached its all-time high in late August, nearly 40% of those 120 companies were trading at over 50% off of their all-time highs. That is a huge amount of dispersion in performance when the index is at its all-time peak. Obviously, through October, those have trended down. Probably more than half are now over 50% off of their all-time highs. But interestingly, the S&P, the vast majority of those companies, are still trading at or close to their all-time highs. And so this suggests that there's lots more dispersion and discipline in the way the public markets have approached biotech stocks. This type of dispersion shows up in all of the post-IPO aftermarket performance as well. As of the end of September, roughly half of 2018's IPOs were above their issue price and half were below. That number is slightly larger now after October. But fundamentally, this chart could be a chart you could share after any annual cohort of IPOs. Dispersion of performance following an IPO, even though it's early innings for most of these companies, is a sign that investors are showing discretion and discernment in how they're backing players coming into the public markets. Again, all three of those show that the rising tide doesn't lift all the boats these days. Shifting then to the early stage uh, venture uh, funding marketplace, sort of first financings and that venture creation process. The green line here represents new biotech startups. As you can see, it's been remarkably flat for close to 10 years. Unlike other areas of, of venture funding, such as software, which have been incredibly dynamic and elastic in the face of demand. And so the point of this is that we are certainly not in an expansionary bubble when it comes to new venture formation because it's been flat despite being in the longest bull run in the history of the industry. You'd think, in light of biotech success, that we would become a bigger share of the venture capital pie. But in fact, that is also not the case. 13 to 15% 10 years ago, we now represent just 11% of the overall venture capital funding. So stepping back and thinking about the balance between those areas of froth and those areas of rational discipline, I think there's reasonable balance in the ecosystem today. Wherever you come out, however, on this spectrum from froth to rational actors, there are at least six things that under any scenario, an investor like Atlas and others have to apply to successfully participate in these capital markets. The first is disciplined truth seeking science first, objective decision making about which deals to be in and which to walk away from. Capital efficiency, treat that equity dollar with enormous respect and connect that to real value inflections. Manage your burn rate, extend your runway, variableize as much as your cost base as you can to be able to control where that runway will take you. Aggregate the best talent in the industry to build and retain the best teams. Recycle those super successful serial entrepreneurs. Connect them into the ecosystem, not only within the company, the venture portfolio, but more broadly across the stakeholders in our ecosystem and drive for win-win partnerships with larger pharmaceutical companies who can bring not only capital and capabilities, but also the possible liquidity paths. So that's a wrap on the equity capital market side of the equation and is a good segue into thinking about those types of partnerships and M&A events. If we look at private biotech M&A activity over the last few years, you'll see that it peaked in 2016 
the columns being number of deals, the lines being both upfront and total deal values. 2015 and 16 were very strong years overall, but the last 18 months or so have been remarkably quiet. In fact, there have been three phases during this period. In the early part of the last decade, M&A was everything. The equity capital markets really didn't exist. Um, IPOs were incredibly rare, and almost all the liquidity in venture was driven through the M&A side of the story. From 2013 through 2016, despite a couple corrections along the way, the equity capital markets and M&A were in a virtuous cycle, each reinforcing each other and driving up both deal activity and access to the capital markets. But in the last 18 months, the equity capital markets have really stripped away and pharma has stepped back. All of this tees up the interesting dynamic that happens in boardrooms. In boardrooms, you can consider partnering with larger pharmaceutical companies, access capital, potential for liquidity, but of course you lose control of your baby and you have to depend on the bureaucratic R&D process in most large companies. The alternative being go into the public markets, raise a crossover round, have an IPO. That growth equity allows you to turn the card on new clinical data and use your stock as a currency to attract and retain great teams. But then you have to deal with the burden of being public and wonderful months like October. But it's fair to say in the last 18 months, most boardrooms have been biased towards this latter path. What I find interesting is once companies are public, it's actually incredibly hard to escape the gravity of the really large balance sheets of large pharma. If we look at R&D stage, public biotech M&A, 2017 and 2018 have been huge years. Lots of companies recently public who had matured have been purchased over the last two years. Really teeing up two distinct strategies as part of the barbell of BD approaches active in pharma today. Step up big later, allow these companies to access large pools of capital, build their programs, pipelines, and platforms, and then acquire them. Good examples being Juno, Kite, and Avexis. Or you have to go early and acquire these businesses and, and assets before they mature enough for the public markets. IFM and Delinear are two of those from the Atlas portfolio. And so if that's the wrap on where the changing landscape is on the M&A side and the equity capital markets, what has this done to overall venture capital returns? We take a look at a distribution plot, multiple across the x-axis, cumulative distribution on the right, and here's a line from what it looked like in the 1990s. Roughly a 50% loss ratio, roughly 15% were greater than 5x winners. In the 2000s, things got tough. Higher loss rates, and fewer overall winners, but the recent decade is the most attractive of all. Less than 40% of our deals are, are, um, are losses, and roughly 15% are above 5x winners. This is a much more attractive curve. When we compare this to other sectors, taking the 800-pound gorilla on the tech side of venture, software and services, you can see how it compares over the last 10 years. Software faces much higher loss ratios and fewer large winners. In fact, in a bit of irony, the 2000s, that period of time so challenging in biotech, that curve looks a lot like software today. Moving away from multiples of invested capital to talk about IRRs and rates of return, in the 1990s, tech massively outperformed the internet bubble, the dot-com movement, significant outperformance, Obviously, everything retracted in the 2000s. Overall, a very tough period for venture, but life sciences relatively outperformed. And then in the last decade, we've seen significant outperformance from the biopharma sector, almost 20 full percentage points. This reflects it's been an exciting time to be in early stage biotech venture in particular, and is a great time to segue into an update on Atlas Venture. Over the next couple minutes, I'm going to cover with one or two slides each our team, strategy, performance, the portfolio, and our future. On the team side, this is the full Atlas team, roughly 20 of us, 10 of us on the investing side, and 10 in ops, finance, and admin. 
It's a really fantastic group to be a part of and a privilege. It's this team that has put forward a strategy of at least six tenants. We are a venture creation firm focused on early stage biotech, all therapeutics, with really a science first approach. We source our science globally and build those companies locally here in Cambridge, all integrating around our mission of doing well by doing good. Our portfolio, while purely in therapeutics, has diversity across business models, either big platform companies that could be new modalities or new areas of biology, all the way to single asset investments with lean virtual teams. These, of course, differ by their capital needs, they differ by the amount of infrastructure they require, and they also differ by their correlation with the public capital markets. But interestingly, you can make great returns up and down the spectrum, depending on how you build those individual companies. In 2018, we've had a great year. In fact, we had a period of about 120 days this spring where Atlas had six of our portfolio companies go public, raising a significant amount of capital at very nice valuations. The Atlas Biopharma Company back in 2016. 2018, two years later, we've seen a significant shift. Lots of those lead op and preclinical programs have moved into the clinic. Today, we have four times more early clinical activity than we did back in 2016. All the companies on the right-hand side have started at least one, if not more than one, clinical program over the last two years. Super exciting time for not only those companies to be turning the card on clinical data, but for Atlas as a whole. As we think about the breakdown of that pipeline across disease area, we're roughly one-third oncology, 20% rare disease, and then covering pretty much every other disease area. On modality, we have small molecules in about 40% of our programs, biologics, cell and gene, and oligos representing the rest. What this chart should suggest is we are truly disease area agnostic and modality agnostic. As science first investors, we try to find great high impact science and help convert it into medicines for patients. Digging deeper into each of the disease areas, here's our overall strategy. In oncology, these are a number of the strategies employed by the industry. Of course, all of these have deep and rich sub-strategies as well and how our current portfolio maps to it. Immuno-oncology has been a big focus across the industry and our portfolio is no exception. A number of companies there, both entering the clinic as well as going public in that arena. We also have antibody drug conjugates at a couple of our companies as well as immunometabolism plays um, on the cancer metabolism side. If we shift to the immunology and autoimmune space, again, a set of core components to the immune system and those underlying strategies and a good mix of our portfolio across the board. On the adaptive side, going after those effector, effector functions as well as regulatory, uh, regulatory nodes in the autoimmune space, some past successes with Padlock and Delinea. On the complement side, two plays, one in the eye and one more generally. And then an inflammatory cell death, a core area of innate immunity today, several investments moving programs forward. And lastly, using bone marrow transplant to reboot the entire immune system at a company called Magenta. On the neurology side of the equation, we have been quite active in neurology over the last five years, um, in particular in neurodegeneration. Um, here's a set of sub-strategies and how our portfolio maps to it. Um, you'll note we do not have any direct proteinopathy plays around beta amyloid, for instance, but we have focused on genetically targeted populations around lysosomal function, neuroinflammation, the area of synaptic resilience and uh, synaptogenesis, as well as axonal degeneration. We remain committed in neuroscience despite the challenges of clinical development and have been approaching this with novel translational strategies. On the rare genetic disease side, this has been an area of much excitement in particular with cell and gene therapies and other cell modalities. Um, and again, we've been quite active here. 
While we do not have any AV platform companies in the Atlas portfolio, we have a number of more modular single product applications in several of our companies. We do have a lentivirus platform at Avro, a large and emerging non-viral non -viral next generation durable gene therapy play at GenBio, and a number of other investments in these spaces. I'll call attention to Dyne working on oligo delivery. This is an antibody that is able to carry oligonucleotides into tissues, in particular into muscle tissues, for a set of rare diseases. On the cardiovascular and metabolic disease side, I honestly wish we could have more activity here, um, but it has been hard to find venture backable theses in these areas. While we have Zafgen focused on genetic obesity and, and areas of energy metabolism, we have relatively few other investments in that space. Heart failure, hypertension, lipids, all areas where we have struggled to find venture backable theses. In the area of NASH, on the fibrosis side, we have several plays, as well as on overall lipid and inflammatory control. Shifting then to the final bucket of other areas, we've been active across a number of other disease areas, including ophthalmology with um, uh, AMD, genetically targeted populations in that category, disc medicine, one of our new companies focused on um, iron overload and iron processes, and then a number in the fibrosis space. And lastly, I'll call attention to Sparrow, our anti-infectives company. So that's a wrap on strategy. One slide to, uh, to conclude. We are focused on high impact science. We're gonna launch six to eight new companies a year for the next few years. We are relentlessly focused on talent, recruiting great talent, not only into our companies, but onto their boards and have a continued focus on the value of diversity, and lastly, on the fund side, actively managing our legacy funds from Fund 7 through Fund 10 and the portfolio companies in them, helping them scale and achieve liquidity, as well as create and fund a new wave of startups out of Fund 11. So thank you very much for your attention and giving me the chance to share this Atlas 2018 year in review.